Christian for the same Christ our Lord. Holy Mary, our hope, seed of wisdom, and pray for us in the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Church presents to each age the saints they require. To this age of sentimentality and a corrosive antinomianism, she places before their eyes the figure of Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti, blessed Pius IX. The rightness of the Church's decision is confirmed by the nearly consistent rage registered by the culture at large upon Pope John Paul II's announcement to beatify Pius IX. Even within the household of the faith, there was only a muted excitement, if not an overt disappointment, in the beatification of the pontiff, who was so utterly sure of himself, so utterly certain of the Church's immutable truths, and so utterly convinced of the reprehensibility of the philosophical errors and general liberal mood of the day. Masai Faraday's 32-year reign on Peter's throne faced the widest range of social, political, theological, and philosophical issues of probably any pontificate in the Church's history. In choosing one small part of that pontificate, the Syllabus of Errors, we did not wish to unjustly constrict the accomplishments which were impressively far-reaching and variegated. It was simply meant to telescope a courage, an intellectual grasp, and an eagerness to lead, even against the most popular trends of his day. No sentimentality in this beatus, only passion for natural and supernatural truths. No hand-wringing hesitation in Pius IX. Only a keen sense that any temporizing might mean the loss of souls. That, of course, is called charity. After all is said and done, charity is what Holy Church looks to as the final test of sanctity. As St. John of the Cross put it in the living flame of love, in the twilight of our lives we shall be judged on charity. This is what the church saw in Pius IX and so raised him to the altars for our imitation. Even though the culture looks at what the church sees as burning charity and sneeringly calls it callous intolerance. Once again, the scholastic doctors are right, quid quid recipitor, recipitor ad modum recipientis. We are pleased to welcome Monsignor Di Giovanni to Christi Vidal's for a second time. Requests continue to be made for his last lecture with Campion series, which was on Pius XII and the Holocaust, and an address subsequently requested by the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. Monsignor Di Giovanni is no stranger to such distinctions. He both founded and acted as rector of the St. John Fisher Seminary Residence in Stamford, Connecticut for seven years, appointed to this position by the then Bishop Edward Egan, who was sufficiently impressed by his abilities to warrant calling him back home to the Bridgeport Diocese after Monsignor had enjoyed an associate fellowship at the Cambridge Center for the Study of Faith and Culture in Cambridge, Massachusetts. During that seven-year tenure, Monsignor Di Giovanni succeeded in producing a showcase seminary residence, attracted some of the finest priestly candidates in the country, and gave Bishop Egan some of the largest ordination classes in the nation, relative to the size of that diocese. His work 
as rector was stellar and insufficiently praised. Monsignor Di Giovanni was ordained in 1977 and in 1983 was awarded the Doctorate in Ecclesiastical History from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He is presently pastor of St. John's in Stamford, Connecticut. It is our pleasure to welcome back our friend Monsignor Stephen Di Giovanni. Good evening. I'm very grateful for Father Paracon for the invitation to speak tonight on Pius IX. I'm also very grateful for my mother for sending him the bribe for that introduction. It was very kind of him. Uh, in 1978, I was a priest, a student priest at the North American College, and it was the 100th anniversary of the death of Pius IX, who was the founder of the North American College. And that, was, that anniversary was welcomed with a yawn. So I took it upon myself to post a two-page essay on Pius IX, which was not welcomed much. But nonetheless, I did it because I thought Pius IX should be merited at least two pages. And I'm very, very grateful to Father Paracone for allowing me this opportunity to give a bit more than two pages uh, on his works, um, which will touch a little bit on the American College, but go beyond that to one of his greatest works, which is the syllabus. I have a bad habit, let me warn you beforehand, of speaking very rapidly. So if I get too quick, just lob a shoe up here, and I'll slow down again, all right? On December 8, 1864, the 10th anniversary of the definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, Pope Pius IX issued his encyclical Quanta Cura, an attendant document entitled, A Syllabus Containing the Most Important Errors of Our Time, Which Have Been Condemned by Our Holy Father Pius IX, in Allocutions, at Consistories, in Encyclicals, and Other Apostolic Letters. Affectionately known as the Syllabus of Errors, it is not a part of the encyclical but a document outline of those errors condemned. The idea of a condemnation of principal errors of the modern world matured simultaneously with the work for the definition of the Immaculate Conception. In fact, the second part of the bull, Inefabilis Deus, defining the Immaculate Conception, explains some of the principal errors of the modern world. So the dogmatic definition of the Immaculate Conception and the syllabus, the syllabus were both strictly connected. The development of the syllabus is rightly the subject of its own paper, with the final version of it issued in 1864 after eight redactions. But right now I'll only give you a brief overview of its history. In 1849, the fathers of the Provincial Council of Spoleto petitioned Pius IX to list the principal errors of the day. Among the council fathers was Gioacchino Pecci, Archbishop of Perugia and the future Pope Leo XIII. His conciliar interventions stemmed from his concern to defend against communism, to which Marx had given philosophical force by the publication of his Communist Manifesto the year before. The lays arose for various reasons, not the least of which were the European revolutions of 1848, the exile of the Pope to Gaeta, and the proclamation of the Roman Republic by Mazzini. Pius IX remained interested in the project and named Cardinal Fornari to the work which finally contained 28 errors. By 1854, the project was transferred to the commission that had drawn up the bull defining the Immaculate Conception. The day after the definition of the Immaculate Conception, in an address to the bishops assembled in Rome, entitled Singulari Quadam, Pius called attention to modern errors and encouraged the bishops to act against them, especially those that threatened the church, such as the teaching of unbelievers, the tenets of state supremacy, rationalism, and re religious indifferentism and the denial of the necessity of the Church for salvation. In 1860, Bishop Gerbet of Perpignan, France, published a pastoral instruction on various errors of the present, and that contained 85 theses. So pleased with the Pope with that, that he commissioned Cardinal Caterini to formulate a syllabus based upon Gerbet's document. In the spring of 1862, more than 300 bishops gathered in Rome for the canonization of the Japanese martyrs. Following the canonization, on Pentecost Sunday, June 8, 1862, the Holy Father read his allocution, Maxima Quidem, to the assembled bishops. It is one of the most important documents of his pontificate, revealing Pius' pastoral anxiety and concern about the Church before the modern world. He enumerated and deplored the widespread modern errors, most, most of which denied the supernatural order and judged Revelation as incapable of communicating absolute truth which was, in any event, subject to human reason and progress. 
Human conscience was the criterion for all truth. The church has no natural authority, so went the popular argument, while the state was all-powerful, even in questions of religion. The document of the Pope is based upon and is a development of his earlier document, Singulare Quadam of 1854. Pius referred to the church as a completely free and perfect society possessed of inalienable rights. It was at this point that the Pope presented a draft of 61 errors, along with the theological qualifications. It was leaked to the liberal anti-clerical Italian press, and a ruckus arose so disturbing that the Pope refrained from promulgating the list until further work had been done. And he established a new commission with the final syllabus containing 80 theses, theses drawn from his allocutions, encyclicals, and apostolic letters. Nothing at all in the list was new. It's not as if there were anything in there that no one had ever heard before. The syllabus was sent to the bishops of the world with an encyclical letter, Quanta Cura, accompanied by an official communication from the Secretary of State, Cardinal Antonelli, dated December 8, 1864. It was not signed by the Pope. The response was immediate and powerfully negative throughout Europe and America, pri primarily because most of the press prohibited or ignored the official ecclesiastical commentaries and erroneous interpretations designed to denigrate the church and the pope. The syllabus, the present syllabus, is composed of ten sections, totaling eighty theses, and among the errors condemned are sort of large, brus uh, broad brush strokes, the ones I'm going to give you right now. Condemned are pantheonism, naturalism, absolute rationalism, indifferentism, socialism, communism, secret societies, errors regarding the church and its rights, errors regarding the state and its relationship to the church, errors regarding natural and Christian ethics, errors regarding Christian matrimony, errors regarding the temporal power of the Pope, and errors regarding modern liberalism. In a political point of view, number 80, the last, was the most heatedly debated. Quote, the Roman pontiff can and should reconcile and harmonize himself with progress, with liberalism, and with recent civilization. This was condemned. And it is condemned, if you read the uh, allocution accompanying the condemnation, it's based upon, against uh, the Piedmontese government's idea of what constituted progress and civilization with the state superior and subjecting the church to itself. In all, the syllabus, the historical context must be understood as provided by the allocutions or earlier papal teachings accompanying the syllabus. This is not an infallible document, but one which Catholics were bound to accept since it came from the Pope in his capacity as universal teacher and judge, as mentioned in Antonelli's accompanying official communication. The response to the syllabus and the encyclical was swift and nearly unanimous in secular and liberal Roman Catholic quarters, since it was interpreted as Pius IX's defiant shaking of his theological fist before pro the progress of the 19th century. The New York Times, my favorite source of information, <laughs> provided its readers with the full encyclical in English, which absolutely flabbergasted me. But it judged, after the whole thing was printed, it judged wrongly that the main reason for the syllabus was the desire of the church to protect its property, its real estate, against the encroachments of the liberal states. That can be found uh, in January 21, 1865. One week later, or excuse me, uh, January 17, one week later, the editor expressed his view that, quote, every government in Europe is assailed by this most extraordinary proclamation. It will fall lifeless on the ears of the Catholic world and will hereafter be interesting to the students of history only as the last protest of the representative of the Middle Ages against the spirit of the 19th century. End quote. That's January 21st. In March, the editor pontificated once more on the nature of the syllabus. While misguided, he wrote, the church showed courage, quote, in the enunciation of the principles to which the church holds itself bound. He continued, quote, it will remain to be seen how far these repeated assaults on popular systems of government tend to promote Roman Catholic unity, end quote. Re reference is then made to the Archbishop of Baltimore, Martin J. Spaulding, who already had declared, according to the editor, openly in opposition to the views of Rome for every one of the rights denounced in the encyclical. The final observation of the daily was, quote, 
These political lectures from Rome, however, are probably not intended for this country. Certainly, they will disturb the views of no one fit to exercise the rights of a citizen or entitled to the heritage of a freeman. End quote. March 16, 1865. The value of the syllabus lies in its references. The poet papal allocutions and instructions from which each point in the syllabus is taken. It was designed as a reference tool for Catholic bishops, a technical document requiring some theological expertise. It was not meant for public consumption, nor for governments, and especially not for the press to understand. But published, it was throughout Europe. In France and Italy, the governments encouraged the liberal press to publish it with their own commentaries and erroneous observations, while not allowing the bishops equal freedom to explain the propositions. Napoleon III even forbade the Catholic bishops to speak of it in their churches. Cardinal Antonelli had postponed the publication of the syllabus because it was a political hot potato, hoping not to offend Napoleon III, Antonelli being a very practical man, whose troops were necessary to protect the papal states from Garibaldi at the time. But in September 1864, in what has come down to be known as the Convention of September, Napoleon III, who styled himself the new Saint, Saint Louis, showed his political hand and deceived the Pope. The agreement between Napoleon III and King Victor Emmanuel was to move the Italian capital from Turin to any other city in Italy, possibly Florence, with Napoleon assuring the removal of French troops from Rome on the condition that the city be preserved from immediate attack by Garibaldi. The general understanding of this, however, was that once France found itself militarily occupied someplace else on the planet, the Savoyard forces would move into Rome to restore order or to respond to an invitation from some leader of a, any Roman uprising that happened to be around at the moment. Once this agreement was concluded, Antonelli saw no need to hold off on the publication of the syllabus, and it was published. The New York Times even got this right on January 29, 1865, calling it, the, the title of the article was, The Secret History of the Syllabus. This was partially the political background for the syllabus, the Italian situation, which had as its underpinnings, through Mazzini, the principles of 1789, and his new religion, and that of Cavour's, of God and the people. Pius IX was seeing these principles brought to their logical, philosophical, theological, and political conclusions in Italy. The practical results, as he saw it, of atheist, rationalist, pantheist, even pro pro Protestant propaganda, of secret societies, of religious indifferentism, of a wrong view of the relations between the church and the state. And the best example of this is, again, Proposition 80, thesis number 80, which stated, which condemned that the idea that the Roman pontiff can and should reconcile and harmonize himself with progress, with liberalism, and with recent civilization. Progress, liberalism, and recent civilization meant different things to different people. In Italy, everybody understood these as referring also to Cavour's free church in a free state, which meant the subjugation of the church to the state, whereby secular education was imposed, monasteries and convents had been forcibly closed by the Savoyard government as it gobbled up the smaller Italian city-states as it, it progressed. Secularism and anti-clericalism were the meaning. In England, progress meant something entirely different. It meant industry. It meant technological advances. It meant the Great Exhibition of 1851. And liberalism meant the English Conservative Party members such as Peel and Gladstone. That's not what the, the, uh, the syllabus was condemning. In France, the phrase was seen as targeting the revolution of 1789. In America, as seen above in the quotes from the New York Times, the syllabus was summarily dismissed as inapplicable to the United States, intended for other countries like France. And so, so strongly did the syllabus touch the raw nerve of the French Revolution that the reason it wasn't permitted to be published, or even the reason uh, the bishops were not permitted to speak in their own churches about it, was because Napoleon III and his ministers publicly uh, acclaimed the syllabus as anti-revolutionary. But the syllabus did more than simply toggle the liberal politics of the 19th century. And this is the most important aspect of the syllabus. It wasn't a political document. It struck, first and foremost, at the philosophical concepts of life that both negated and limited the rights of God over man and human society.
Let me repeat that. It struck at the philosophical concepts of life that both negated and limited the rights of God over man and human society. The most important defense and explanation of the syllabus, which I'll again just give a brief uh, mention of, was offered by the Bishop of Orléans, Félix Antoine Philibert dupin loup in his pamphlet, The September Convention and the Encyclical of December 8th. His thesis was that one may authentically understand the syllabus only if one begins with the premise that the Pope was condemning propositions subspecie eternitatis and in terms of absolute and eternal principles to be applied to a perfect society. The Church was simply denying the eternal and universal validity of the claims made by the enemies of the Church. For instance, by condemning the claims of the rationalists, the Church was denying the absolute supremacy of reason without faith. This was not a consideration of the validity of reason itself or as an ally of faith. The condemnation of absolute freedom of worship, of belief, of press, or of speech stated that it was inconceivable to support as an ultimate and universal ideal a society which held false beliefs or tolerated propaganda against the sacraments or other essentials of Catholic practice or which taught such errors in speech or in print. Throughout the pamphlet, dupin Lu uses the term thesis to explain the ideal of the true society and antithesis, that which is possible in the existing state. Since her opponents spoke of terms of absolutes, the Church had to clarify what were true absolutes, or at least deny those that were false. A common misinterpretation, continued the Bishop of Orléans, was to suppose that the opposite of a condemnation of a condemned proposition was absolutely true. So, for instance, it was erroneous to say that the Catholic Church should everywhere be disestablished. But neither was it true to say that she should always be the established Church. The general misunderstanding of the syllabus, especially in its teachings about the relationship of Church and State, led governments in Paris, London, Turin, and Berlin to fits of anxiety when considering what, that the negative propositions of the syllabus concerning freedom of the press, for instance, might one day be positively condemned by the Church as always wrong. The decrees of Vatican I, like De Filius, did give dogmatic precision to matters of traditionally accepted faith, such as the nature of God and of revelation, which had been denied by deists or pantheists, and the denials were condemned by the syllabus. The political principles of 1789 and of the European liberal governments were simply stigmatized by the Church, as in the syllabus, with no further mention necessary. Pius IX was first and foremost the defender of the supernatural order, and the definition of the Immaculate Conception, the syllabus, and the First Vatican Council with its definition of papal infallibility formed three aspects of the same work before the extravagant claims of 1789 and the principles that subsequently developed and were in vogue in 19th century Europe. This was no exercise in idle argumentation. The history of Europe can be seen in the struggle of the church and the empires for the control of the hearts and souls of the people, battles between the gospel and nationalism. Since the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, nationalism and rationalism had become companions, too often with the Catholic Church and faith targeted for replacement by human reason, science, and human liberty as absolute goods. Pius had a definite interest in the formation of the clergy and clear teaching as safeguards of the universal church's liberty to preach the divine, revealed truth in a world overly convinced of the power of human reason and of the positive effects of scientific and technological progress. Jansenism and Gallicanism were very much alive in the church in Europe and elsewhere, whereby the local governments control the rights of the church, the movement of bishops, and the publication of papal documents within their territories. An example could be found in Italy, where King Victor Emmanuel and his forces sought to unify the Italian peninsula. Their slogans concerning the unification of the various Italian states into one kingdom responded more to the imperial aspirations of the King of Savoy than to the national aspirations of the Italian people, whose loyalties were to their province, their city, their family, and to their local lives, rather than to any united Italian nation. The plans for unification also supposed the subjection of the church to the state, 
the practical effects of which were seen in the closure of the monasteries and convents and the confiscation of church property throughout Italy. This was the free church in a free state, as touted by the slogans of the day. The Roman question, what to do with the Pope and the Vatican on the part of the unifying forces of King Victor Emmanuel and Garibaldi, was much more than a question of any opposition by the church concerning the pol political future of Italy or of real estate. It dealt with the very life of the church, its freedom to preach the gospel, and the Pope's ability to exercise freely his Petrine ministry in the face of an intemperate nationalism. It also dealt with human dignity. In 1859, Pius told the young seminarians at the opening of the North American College in Rome, quote, It is not weapons, nor armed men, that must fear, nor the forces of any power. It is not the loss of the temporal domain that afflicts our heart most. What afflicts us and frightens us far more is the perversion of ideas, this horrible evil of falsifying everything. Vice, in fact, is taken for virtue, and virtue for vice. And matters have come to such a pass in some cities of this poor Italy that men have practically deified the assassin and assassination. Yet while they lavish acclaim and praise upon the most wicked men and deeds, they have the effrontery to brand as hypocrisy, fanaticism, and abuse of religion, firmness in the faith, and the very constancy of the bishops in the defense of its sacred rights and its good works. Now, more than ever before, is the time to take vengeance upon them in the name of God, and the vengeance of the priesthood and of the, of the vicar of Christ can only be prayer and supplication that they may all be converted and live. The worst of evils we know only too well is the corruption of the heart and the damaging of the mind, and it can be overcome only by the greatest miracle which God can work and which we must beg him to accomplish, end quote. And this is, was his main point. The reaction to the syllabus was not simply political. It was also in the intellectual sphere, if you will, uh, of, of Europe at the time. The liberal Catholics were flabbergasted. Montalam Montalambert, Dollinger, Acton, absolutely flabbergasted because they had a desire to put forward a liberal notion that the intellect could pursue its own purposes, totally unchecked and without any reference to the magisterium, to the church, except in matters of dogma, specifically defined dogma. And Pius, with the syllabus and even before the syllabus, stated, no, there's only one truth, just like Thomas said, there's only one truth, no matter whether it's theological or historical or scientific or anything, there's only one truth, and the source of that one truth is God. And therefore the church has every right guided by the Spirit, to analyze and look at science, at philosophy, at history, at all of the studies and disciplines, intellectual disciplines, in order to search for truth and in order to warn the human mind and heart what will lead away from the source of all truth, who is God. Here was revealed the contrast of the present situation of the church in the world and the papacy and the reason for Pius's works, especially the syllabus. As the Christian culture of Europe was crumbling, the Pope was a sign of hope that there was something better to be had than what man alone could provide. His was a pastoral anxiety, if you will, as Giacomo Martina states, to defend the church, without which humanity would have no protection against the slavery to which all of the isms of the age would inevitably lead. The definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, the syllabus of errors, the definition of papal infallibility, all of these were of one piece. Absolutely all of these were of one piece. And they all form a unity of action on the part of Pius IX in the face of all of these isms that had captivated European society, politics, and thought since the French Revolution, all of which rejected God, the Church, and the faith. Rationalism, excessive nationalism, deism, atheism, pantheism, had all been condemned by Pius' syllabus of errors. Man's reason, science, and technology were judged, were uh, improperly judged, capable of scrutinizing all reality and of solving all problems to create the perfect world. God, in the popular mind and in the intellectual uh, arena of Europe at the time, God was unnecessary. Faith, mere illusion. Revelation, myth. Reason was set against faith, 
since the Enlightenment. Once such ideas were joined to revolutionary and Latin nationalistic movements of the subsequent centuries, the practical effect was the curtailment of the Church's freedoms and the subjection of the Church to the governments of the age. The martyrdom of priests and religious sisters, the closure of churches and confiscation of church property, the outlawing of the Catholic Church and the establishment of a new non-Christian state religion, all were part of the French Revolution. The kidnapping of Popes Pius VI and VII by Napoleon, and the total subjection of the church to the state, the total takeover of all education in France, all were immediate practical effect of the principles of 1789. It was not human freedom that the church opposed, but rather the attempted destruction of the church in Europe in the name of liberty, human reason, and in the name of excessive nationalism. Pius was very much aware of all of this and had experienced firsthand the practical effects of such ideas in the anti-clerical ferocity of the prevailing political movements of the time, when in 1848 he barely escaped capture in Rome and went into exile in Gaeta as the Roman Republic was pro proclaimed. Pius IX saw the world from the basis of faith, rather a different angle from that of the politicians in Turin or Rome, London, Paris, Berlin, or Vienna. He saw the Church as the ageless, supercultural body of Christ, established by our Lord to continue his work of forgiving sins and teaching the truth, and against which the gates of hell would never prevail. In all the works of Pius IX, there is an evident continuity, and by them he stood squarely before those who exalted human reason over faith, national loyalty over love for the Church, all of whom denied the rights of God while extolling their own. Pius clearly stated that life is useless without the truth of God, which is revealed only by Jesus Christ through the Church. Pius was not against human freedom. He was against the excesses of parties, groups, and nations that led to a spiritual, intellectual, and political slavery because they ignored the revealed truth of God in his Church. The Pope was fascinated by the United States, absolutely fascinated, and by the growth of the Church here. He even kept a copy of Archbishop Gaetano Bedini's 1854 report about America in his personal papers throughout his life. He respected George Washington and the liberties provided by the Constitution. That sounds odd, because he's supposed to be the curmudgeon against all liberties. But he thought George Washington was a swell guy. And in 1854, he even sent a block of marble to Washington, D.C. for the Washington Monument. It was later dumped in the Potomac River by the, na by the nativists, by the know-nothings. During Pius' uh, visit to, again, the American College in Rome on December 8, 1859, he stopped at a statue of our first president and said, quote, This is the portrait of a great man, the father of his country, end quote. And he urged the young Americans to give three cheers. He repeated the exact same thing during another visit, January 19, 1870, the year when the papal st uh, states fell, when he noted that Washington was, quote, a good man, a great good man and had the students repeat the cheers again for George Washington. On September 19, 1870, the students of the North American College wrote the Pope, offering to join the small papal army to defend Rome. This is the day before the breach of the Roman walls. Pius wrote back to them, thanking them for the devotion, but he refused their offer, writing, quote, May God bless you and give you the grace and courage to fight his battles, end quote. The temporal power was not his chief interest. It was the liberty of the church to preach the revealed truth of Christ. And the American seminarians, as well as other well-formed priests, were to be his instruments for a greater battle, for the minds and, ha and hearts of men and women everywhere. Their tools would be Pius's dogmatic definitions and the syllabus, based upon a wisdom greater than man's. Pius IX's hero was Pope Pius VII, who had been kidnapped and imprisoned by Napoleon. On the evening of Pius IX's escape from the Quirinal Palace in 1848, Pius clutched a small ciborium containing the Blessed Sacrament, the same ciborium which had been carried by Pius VII in like circumstances a few decades earlier. The legacy of both men was hope to a world that was becoming more and more secular, that is, self-centered, self-concerned, and more convinced of its own self-sufficiency. They stood their ground, and that's why nobody likes them. They stood their ground and clearly stated that there is something greater than human reason and liberty, and that is God's love and truth. 
The isms of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries proved this to be true. The aftermath of the French Revolution, the sufferings brought on by Napoleon, the European revolutions of 1848, the sufferings brought about by the Risorgimento in Italy. I wouldn't be here if there had been no Risorgimento, with my relatives having nearly been forced out by a nearly forced famine for decades because most of the young men had been taken on uh, into forced, uh, a forced draft in, into one of the largest standing armies in Europe after the fall of the Papal States. World War I, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, World War II, the advance of communism, and one might even put in there legalized abortion, just to only mention a few. Pius IX left us hope that there is a reality greater than the one mankind can forge, and is, is created by God, enlivened by his grace through his church. Once God is removed from his creation, man becomes less than human. Once revealed truth is removed from society, utility and might become the basis for morality. Pius clearly taught this in his encyclical Quanta Cura that accompanied the syllabus. I want to read a little lengthy quote from that encyclical. Quote, And since where religion has been removed from civil society and the doctrine and authority of divine revelation repudiated, the genuine notion itself of justice and human right is darkened and lost and the place of true justice and legitimate right is supplied by material force. Thence it appears why it is that some, utterly neglecting and disregarding the surest principles of sound reason, dare to proclaim that the people's will, manifested by what is called public opinion, or in some other way, constitutes a supreme law, free from all divine and human control, and that in the political order accomplished fact, from the very circumstances that they are accomplished, have the force of right. But who does not see and clearly perceive that human society, when set loose from the bonds of religion and true justice, can have, in truth, no other end than the purpose of obtaining and amassing wealth, and that society under such circumstances follows no other law in its actions except the unchastened desire of ministering to its own pleasures and interests." End quote. Politically, the syllabus can be seen as an absolute failure. But then, it was never intended as a political document. It is a religious document, concerned with an essentially religious task, the preservation of the rights of God and his creation, and the protection by the church of the human person as his image. Pius IX in the syllabus, in the definition of immaculate conception, and in infallibility, Pius IX was a sign of hope for all of us. Thank you.